The information in this video is based on the most current information available at the time of production. While affordable safety training works hard to make sure these materials are current, the employer has sole responsibility for compliance with all applicable laws, regulations, and standards. This video is sold with the understanding that affordable safety training is not providing professional or legal advice. Employers should have a reliable source for current regulatory information and best practices. Silicon dioxide, commonly known as silica, comprises more than 10% of the mass of the Earth's crust. Silica is found in sand, soil, rocks, and many other naturally occurring materials. In its normal form, it is usually not hazardous. When silica-containing materials are cut, sawed, drilled, ground, or crushed, silica dust can be released. In this form it is known as respirable crystalline silica and exposure can cause serious health problems. In the United States, it is estimated that 100,000 workers in general industry, and 2 million workers in construction, are exposed to respirable crystalline silica each year. The objectives of this course are to 1. Understand the potential sources of respirable crystalline silica. 2. Understand the health hazards of silica. 3. Understand OSHA requirements for occupational silica exposure. 4. Understand the engineering controls, work practices, and personal protective equipment required for work tasks with silica exposure. 5. Understand the available medical monitoring for workers with occupational silica exposure. Crystalline silica commonly appears in nature as quartz. In construction environments, silica can be found in many, many places, such as asphalt, brick, cement, concrete, drywall, cement fiber board, grout, mortar, silica paints, plaster, rock, tile, sand, soil, stone, stucco, and many other materials. If it is made from earthen matter, it likely contains some form of silica. While it is whole, silica-containing materials are not hazardous. When they are converted to a respirable dust, they become very dangerous. Sawing, cutting, drilling, chipping, grinding, milling or crushing silica-containing materials will create this hazardous silica dust. A wave of fear was sweeping the country. Silicosis was taking its toll from the ranks of American workers. Cause of the disease, dust. Results of the disease, disablement, poverty, death. Cure for the disease, none. Throughout America, workers exposed to dust grew fearful of their health, of their very lives. 1936. Amid these alarming events, the Secretary of Labor called together a national conference to study this disease. A committee of 60 experts was appointed and a year later reported to the Secretary of Labor. But let's hear from Miss Perkins herself. After a year of work, the National Silicosis Conference Committee has just made its report of findings and recommendations. And I feel it to be my duty to make this report available to the working people of the United States and to their employers by every available method. This report shows how silicosis occurs, where it occurs, and what the disease is, and it makes recommendations for its practical control. Above all, the report emphasizes that these control measures, if conscientiously adopted and applied, that silicosis can be prevented. When silica dust is inhaled, it absorbs into the lungs, causing inflammation and scarring. This makes it difficult for the lungs to process oxygen. Excess exposure can cause a lung disease known as silicosis. 
Symptoms of silicosis include shortness of breath, cough, fatigue, loss of appetite and weight loss, chest pain, fever, and darkening of skin. Silicosis is a chronic disease, so symptoms may not show up until years after exposure. There is no cure for silicosis, and it can be fatal. Respirable crystalline silica exposure can cause lung ailments, such as chronic pulmonary disease. It weakens the immune system, which makes you more susceptible to illness. Exposure can also cause kidney disease and kidney failure. Silica is a known carcinogen, and can cause lung and other cancers. The Occupational Safety and Health Administration has implemented a set of regulations to protect workers from the hazards of respirable crystalline silica. 29 CFR 1926.1153, requires employers to 1. Assess silica hazards in the workplace. 2. Utilize engineering and workplace controls to minimize exposure. 3. Provide respiratory protection as required. 4. Implement silica housekeeping practices. 5. Provide a medical surveillance program. 6. Communicate hazards to employees. 7. Create a written exposure control plan. 8. Maintain silica compliance records. These rules apply to any employer with an airborne respirable crystalline silica level of 25 micrograms per cubic meter or greater, under normal or any foreseeable conditions. This is known as the action level. When it is determined that a task exceeds the action level, the employer is bound by the requirements of the silica standard. The company must ensure that exposure is kept below the permissible exposure limit of 50 micrograms per cubic meter. This is the maximum safe exposure level determined by OSHA. Anything above 50 micrograms per cubic meter requires employer action to reduce exposure. It does not take a lot of dust to meet the permissible exposure limit. On the right is the amount of silica dust it takes to reach the PEL in one day, and the left is how much dust it takes for a year. OSHA created a list of common construction tasks that involve silica hazards. Each task has corresponding engineering controls and respiratory protection requirements. This list is known as Table 1, and it provides all the required steps for protecting workers. If the employer fully implements all the exposure controls listed in Table 1, no exposure monitoring or additional work controls are required. For example, Table 1 requires cement fiber board to be cut outside, with a manufacturer-recommended dust collection system. If this is done, the employer does not have to perform any exposure monitoring, and respirators are not required. Rig-mounted core saws must include an integrated water delivery system and be operated in accordance with the manufacturer's instructions. If these requirements are met, no respiratory protection is required. When performing a task with silica exposure hazards, check Table 1 for instructions on how to provide proper protection. When Table 1 cannot be followed, the actual level of silica exposure must be determined. Silica sampling must reflect the exposure of employees on each shift, for each job classification, in each work area. Employees have the right to observe any monitoring of exposure to silica. If the air sample is less than the action level of 25 micrograms per cubic meter of air, no further sampling is required. If it is above the action level, but below the PEL of 50 micrograms per cubic meter, then sampling must be repeated every six months. If the sample is greater than the PEL, sampling must be repeated every three months, and engineering and work practice controls must be implemented to reduce exposure below the permissible exposure limit. Engineering controls involve using equipment or materials to limit exposure. The most effective engineering control is to select a material that does not contain silica. This is often not possible. The two main types of silica engineering controls are wet methods and local exhaust ventilation. Wet methods involve applying water or a foam at the point of dust generation to keep it from getting into the air. This walk-behind saw has an integrated water delivery system to prevent dust generation. 
Local exhaust ventilation removes dust by capturing it at the point it is created. This power saw has a vacuum attachment to prevent dust from spreading. All exhaust ventilation must filter with 99.97% or greater efficiency. Isolation is an engineering control that separates the worker from the source of exposure. This saw is fully encased to prevent dust from escaping. Work practice controls involve performing a task in a way that reduces the likelihood, or level, of exposure. Examples of work practice controls include inspecting and maintaining equipment controls, making sure nozzles spray water at the point of dust generation, and ensuring supply and exhaust hoses are not kinked. Schedule work so that tasks with high exposure are performed while no other employees are in the area. Wetting down silica dust, before it is swept, is another important work practice control. Let's take a look at how engineering and work practice controls are utilized. This worker is using a saw supplied with water from a portable container, but the container is not pressurized. The other worker notices, and pumps the handle to supply water and minimize the dust. The water supply is the engineering control, and ensuring the container is pressurized is a work practice control. Both have to work for the protection system to be effective. If engineering and work practice controls cannot reduce the exposure level below the PEL, then respiratory protection may be required. Respirators should only be used as a last resort, in the event that other methods are not sufficient. When respirators are required, the employer must comply with the OSHA Respiratory Protection Standard, which includes fit testing, medical evaluations, respirator training, and a written respiratory protection plan. Training is required for every employee with potential silica exposure. This training must include the health hazards of silica exposure, tasks in the workplace that may have silica exposure, the engineering controls, work practices, and respirators required to protect employees, the contents of the OSHA silica standard, the competent person responsible for silica compliance, and the purpose and description of the medical program. Training should also include field instruction on the engineering controls, work practices, equipment, and personal protective equipment used on the job site. Good housekeeping techniques will limit the amount of silica exposure. Never use dry sweeping, or compressed air, to clean up silica dust. It will just spread the dust, and increase exposure. Use a high-efficiency vacuum to collect the dust, or spray it down with water, and collect the wet dust slurry. These housekeeping practices are only required for potential respirable silica dust. Normal cleaning methods can be used for general dust, soil, or large debris. Each site will designate specific housekeeping techniques that are appropriate for the job. Work areas with respirable crystalline silica hazards must be isolated, to limit the number of employees exposed. Signs, caution tape, flaggers, or other techniques may be used. Everyone on the job site must know and understand these measures, and stay clear of the silica areas. Only workers authorized by the employer may enter a silica hazard area. A competent person must be designated to oversee silica safety compliance. A competent person is capable of identifying existing and foreseeable respirable crystalline silica hazards in the workplace, and has authorization to take prompt corrective measures to eliminate, or minimize them. The competent person must make frequent, and regular inspections of job sites, materials, and equipment to ensure proper implementation of the silica exposure control plan. The employer must create a written exposure control plan that explains the steps taken to protect employees from silica exposure. This program must include a description of the tasks in the workplace that involve respirable crystalline silica exposure, a description of the engineering controls, work practices, and respiratory protection used to limit employee exposure, a description of silica housekeeping measures, a description of the procedures used to restrict access to silica hazard areas.
employees must be trained on the contents of the silica exposure control plan, and it must be available for review. Any employee who, as part of the silica standard, is required to wear a respirator 30 or more days a year, must have access to free medical monitoring, at least once every three years. The medical surveillance is designed to detect any adverse effects of silica exposure. These exams are important, because they verify the effectiveness of the respirator program. The medical exam includes a general physical, chest X-ray, pulmonary function test, TB test, and other tests deemed appropriate by the physician. Sandblasting of rough castings in foundries is one of the dustiest of operations. These workers wear helmets, like deep-sea divers, into which clean, filtered air is fed. They work in a tightly closed room so that other workers in the foundry are not exposed. In many cases, silicosis control is just as simple as this. Oil sawdust sprinkled on floors. Or wet sweeping keeps the dust down. In other words, good plant housekeeping. The vibrating screen. See how dusty it is. Workers would be exposed were it not for the exhaust system, which, when turned on, draws the dust off carrying it through a system of pipes to a dust collector. This is the dusty bagging operation we saw earlier. However, with the exhaust system in operation, there is no dust in the air. The worker wears an approved filter respirator for added protection during periods of temporary exposure. In this close-up, the dust is being carried at high speed into the suction system, where it is collected. And here is the way this dusty servicing machine can be controlled by using a suction device. Note how the dust and stone chips are drawn into the hood, and thus kept away from the workman's nose and mouth. It is important for every worker to protect themselves from the hazards of respirable crystalline silica. Know the tasks on your job site that create silica hazards. If the job involves cutting, grinding, chipping, sawing, or blasting natural materials, there is a good chance a silica hazard exists. Review the engineering and work practice controls required to keep you safe. Consult Table 1 and the Silica Exposure Control Plan for a complete list. If required, wear respirators and other personal protective equipment. Never dry sweep or use compressed air on silica dust. Always use high-efficiency vacuums, or wet methods, for cleaning. Isolate silica hazard areas, and post warnings for employees to stay clear. Never enter a silica hazard area, unless you are authorized and have a task to perform. In the past, silica has been deadly. With the proper care and equipment, we can make silicosis a disease for the history books.